The following interview was conducted with Ellsworth P. Christmas, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on December, Thursday, December 10, 2009 in Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview, and the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Christmas. Thank you very much. We'll pick up. We'll start with the Purdue Brazil project, which you were head of party for, chief of party for some time. Well, period. I I was uh, invited to uh, to go to Brazil in uh, 1969, and uh, early, uh, well, shortly after the first year. Can't give you the exact time, but sometime after the first year of '69. Um, why Dr. Peterson uh, called me into his office one Monday when I was here for staff meeting and uh, said, uh, have you heard of our project in Brazil, South America? I said, I've heard about it, yes, but I don't know much about it. He said, we have a vacancy and your name has been suggested that perhaps I talk to you about the possibility of going to Brazil for two years. And so uh, I went home, we talked about it, and a couple of weeks later then I said, well, we'll, we'll discuss it in, in quite a bit of depth now. I think we're mildly interested. Well, to make a long story short, we departed the U.S. on July 1 of that year, headed for Brazil. And that was a two-year assignment. And at the end of the, uh, the two years, uh, well, in fact, it was before the two years had been completed why I was invited to return for a second two years. And then after that, uh, the uh, project was extended an additional six months, and I, I stayed until uh, the project was uh, actually terminated. Okay. So when we were finished then, was that 73, or was that when the project ended? In December of, uh, okay. of 73, yes. For researchers, uh, could you make a comment, that, that how, did, how long had it been going? Well, you know, the, the, the total about? project from its inception was in the very early 1950s. I want to say 1951, and it was basically, uh, at the start, an extension uh, project. And uh, I think there were either two or three individuals that uh, went to Brazil. And then after, a, I can't give you the number of years, two or three or so, a decision was made to increase this to a full-fledged institution development project and then uh, in the late 50s, a very large number of Purdue faculty then uh, moved to uh, Visosa uh, in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil and, and then worked on that project. Again, uh, the objective was to develop a, a university patterned after land-grant university where you had uh, teaching, extension research and um, I happen to be near the end of that project in fact uh, the last person to leave uh, Visosa. Mm -hmm. Were there any other, was it strictly a Purdue or were there any other uh, countries or, or are there people from other states that were involved in it? Uh, this particular project at Visosa was strictly Purdue. Okay. Now there were other projects involving other universities. Uh, Ohio State was involved in a project uh, Wisconsin was involved in a project, and I think there may have been one more uh, that were uh, where they were stationed at universities. Then there there were a couple of other special projects, like one in the seed industry. Um, then there was another one related to the Cerrado soils, uh, but those were much later. Mm -hmm. uh, Purdue's, I think, was probably the first of the institution building uh, projects. Uh, and, uh, of course, I'm very biased, but I, I feel it was probably the most successful of all of them. Did, uh, were you involved in uh, recruiting faculty? Did they want local faculty to, uh, when the school was up and running? Well, uh, I did not teach okay. 
any classes. Mm -hmm. I was more of a, I don't want to say consultant, but really that was about the way it sure. was. Uh, I helped them when they had questions, uh, and um, some of the my involvement was very unusual, unique, so to speak. Uh, my first uh, request was within two weeks after I arrived. Uh, the individual professor uh, with whom I shared an office asked for advice on buying a hay baler. And uh, after a long, lengthy discussion, uh, we had developed a requisition to purchase a hay baler. And of course, the big point of contention was a motor for that hay baler. And I insisted that they not buy a motor for the hay baler because on-farm experience told me that motors on hay balers were problems. So we uh, purchased, or they purchased the hay baler. And then in January, after, and I'd only been there six months, so my Portuguese was not good at all. The language of conversation was, would it be English and Portuguese, or primarily? Well, within the university, we could speak a lot of English because there were a number of professors that had master's degrees on some PhDs outside Brazil, most of them in the U.S. And I was very fortunate that uh, the individual I was working with on the hay baler uh, had a master's degree in animal nutrition uh, here in the U.S. Uh, but uh, once you left the campus, uh, then you would have to depend quite heavily on Portuguese. And of course, not having studied Portuguese, I knew very little. I could count to 10 before I <laughs> went to Brazil and a little more and say hi, good morning. Uh, but uh, we were given uh, classes um, uh, in fact, uh, the first, uh, I think it was two or three months, I think it was three months that I was there, uh, we took a full half day uh, tutoring classes. And then uh, the, the next uh, three, four months, uh, then it was two hours. And I think it went on for two hours then for uh, the next uh, six months. So after about a full year, then, then I was on my own, so to speak, um, but uh, I really knew very little uh, Portuguese, but I have, I guess I'm fortunate because I've been able to retain a lot. Uh, today my um, vocabulary is uh, a little on the short side because of new technologies, and there's a new vocabulary, and I did not learn that vocabulary because the technologies didn't exist at that time. Sure. Uh, but I get along, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, this past year, I hosted six groups of Brazilian farmers uh, here at the Agronomy Research Center. Oh, good. So, were you able to, to come back to the states during your those two year segments that you had? Well, it, it was a policy that that at the end of two years, if oh. you were um, uh, selected to continue and and elected to continue for an additional two years, you would get a home leave of just short of a full month. Uh, and um, so we did have a home leave of, of between three and four weeks where we were able to come home and uh, spend some time uh, with uh, Nancy's folks and, sure. and with my folks. Yeah, well that's good, okay. Now then after you came back, what was the next stage and you came back to the department after you that? Well, that I came. Would have been, then you moved into that. Is this the ag and natural resources? You want to talk about that, or? Well, when when I first came back, uh, I moved back into the agronomy department uh, as an extension specialist, and uh, within about, uh, I want to say, three months, two to three months after returning, uh, I was invited to uh, consider. Uh, being assistant director of the extension service or what we call the Ag and Natural Resources program leader and um, my initial reaction was no and so then after about another month 
uh, why I was uh, asked a second time uh, to, and basically the question was, why did you not accept it the first time? And I gave my reasons, and I, the question then was, would you write me a letter listing your concerns as conditions for taking the position? And if I can meet your conditions, would you accept the position? And I said, yes. So I wrote the letter, and some three weeks or so later, I received a phone call saying, uh, the position is yours. So. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. I'll go ahead. And what, what, uh, what was involved and what was your responsibilities and with that? Well, this was a change for the Cooperative Extension Service because, at least in the North Central region, and I'm assuming this was national, but uh, the North Central region, all, the st all of the states uh, uh, developed uh, program leaders for each of the areas, which would be uh, Ag Natural Resources, uh, Home Economics, uh, now called Consumer Family Sciences, 4-H uh, and Youth, and Community Development. And uh, this was a brand new position. Uh, there, there was nothing in terms of uh, precedence of what one should do or how one should operate. And so uh, we had uh, the North Central Region. We had regular meetings, and I recall the first meeting None of us really knew what we were supposed to do uh, because uh, it was pretty wide open. But basically, it was a position of coordinating or leading uh, the agricultural extension program within the state, okay. which meant that the individual worked both with the extension specialist based on the, on the campus. And campus as, here. Yes, here at Purdue, or if it were another state on, on their land-grant college campus and also work with the extension field staff and um, help organize meetings, um, programs, uh, coordinate things, and um, particularly if there was a statewide program where uh, much of the detail or organization fell on the, the ANO pro a and our program leader to, to carry out. Mm -hmm. And one of those big activities occurred what, every three years, it was called the Farm Progress Show. That still goes on, doesn't it? Or they changed, uh, yeah. was Purdue, had, they was in, uh, not too far from here a couple of years ago. Now it's moved to Illinois, is that the same? Well, uh, the about? Farm Progress Show yeah. still exists, uh -huh. but uh, it's totally different than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. Because it rotated between three states at that time, and now they have a semi-permanent location in Illinois, okay, right. and Indiana and Illinois work together in terms of the extension service and and their assistance with with the show. So it's not uh, uh, quite the same as it was before because uh, the Indiana Cooperative Extension Service does not have full responsibility. But then they we share that responsibility okay. with Illinois. Okay, and they have a, a special site there now, a permanent location. Yes, it's a, it's a semi-permanent location. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. as it is in Iowa. Okay. Uh, they selected the Iowa site first, and I think they held it there either two or three uh, cycles, and then they uh, organized a similar arrangement in western Illinois. Uh, to serve both Indiana and Illinois. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, for a leadership, did you you had training sessions? Did you work with them? And as in, in addition to programming? Yes, I was responsible okay. for organizing in-service training for okay. the uh, agricultural uh, field staff. And uh, in the early years, those were usually three-day training sessions, and we divided them into basically four program areas. Uh, we would offer a, a, a three-day training session in animal science, uh, one in crop production, uh, one in, in uh, farm management and marketing, 
and another in horticulture. Uh, the horticulture was usually a smaller one because at that time we only had five uh, extension field staff in horticulture, but we had other field staff that were in counties with horticultural production that would attend. So usually those groups were, those training sessions were relatively small, whereas the others would, would uh, normally um, have anywhere from 35 to 50 mm -hmm. of the field staff. Okay. Uh, we have 92 counties, and so we have 92 ANR um, educators. And uh, so, and at that time, we actually uh, sort of divided them a little bit from the standpoint that about a third of them were well trained in, in farm management, about a third in crop production, about a third in, in animal science, animal production. And that was just sort of a natural break. And it was nice when you had a three county cluster where one uh, county uh, person would be uh, very knowledgeable in animal production, another in crop production, another in farm management market. That, that permitted them to do a, a, a rather effective job of, of organizing meetings and conducting educational programs uh, within a three county sure. arrangement. Uh, it, that, it didn't work well all across the state merely because your your distribution of uh, trained staff wasn't the same across right. all the state. You tried to have the the, the courses in their location, yes. in where they're located. And did you have some on campus here as well? Or uh, well, the extension specialists are housed within the in academic departments here on the campus, and uh, I really. Uh, worked with them primarily uh, in terms of some certain statewide meetings, but more in terms of assistance to the field staff. Which they had a lot of contact with. Yes. Lee Sun with you. Then. Okay, that's good. Um, and then you were going to make just a comment about the, your research and some in line with this a little bit. Well, from uh, I, I, I served 15 years as the assistant director of uh, extension here in Indiana and then had the opportunity to move back to my home department of agronomy uh, as uh, uh, Marvin uh, Swearingen retired and he was a state soybean extension specialist and so then I became the state soybean extension specialist in, uh, in uh, 1989 mm -hmm. and um, my uh, appointment was uh, 85% extension and 15% uh, research. And uh, my uh, field research was primarily uh, related to problem solving, uh, problems that I would observe in the field uh, during the, the summer months as I uh, traveled the state uh, doing uh, troubleshooting of problem fields, or problems that uh, producers would call to my attention. And so those, those were the things that I tried to work on. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the big problems early, not a problem necessarily, but there was a push to plant soybeans early. And so I conducted a rather extensive uh, study uh, around the state uh, with uh, over a period of five or six years we planted starting in late March all the way through to late June or early July, depending on whether you were north or south. And uh, then to actually see what is the ideal date of planting in the various parts of the state. And um, what happens if you do plant early? I mean, very early, like first part of April. Uh, well, the data turned out to be that the dates that we had been suggesting as ideal for planting soybeans were the dates that were ideal. And actually it did not matter whether you were in southern Indiana or northern Indiana. That magical date was the same. 
And if we stop and think about it, uh, nothing unusual about that because soybeans flower based on day length. And the longest day or the shortest night, whichever way you want to look at it, occurs the same day in southern Indiana as in northern Indiana. And the fact that we grow different maturity groups because of the difference in, in uh, the length of growing season, they all react the same. So the magical date is the same, whether in southern Indiana or northern Indiana, but the maturity group is different. That's interesting. Did it have any impact on the daylight saving? Did that make any difference at all? It doesn't affect no. the farm? Does it? No. Okay. Okay. Cause no. Some people are were always more comfortable with the standard and, and being raised in Ohio, we always had daylight saving. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, uh, it, it really has no impact. Uh -huh. It's just, uh, in fact, most of us uh, work according to the sun when it comes to, to uh, agricultural work or field work. Uh, and uh, what, it, what the clock says doesn't have a great <laughs> impact on us. Very good point, good point. Uh, any uh, committees, did you serve on any university or the department school committees that you'd like to comment on? I Not, not, not too many, uh -huh. no. Um, I can't, uh, I did serve on a couple, uh, and I can't even remember now what sure. they were. Uh, but, um, uh, of course, you're always involved in departmental committees and departmental assignments, and I had my share of those. Sure. Uh, and uh, one of them probably that was prob that, that required a lot of time and effort was chairing the uh, large field day at the agronomy center. And that responsibility during the 15 years I was back in extension, uh, I had that responsibility on two different occasions. Yeah. We rotate that, uh, and now the, we, we no longer hold that, that field day because uh, we hold smaller field days uh, around the state, and um, uh, we participate in field days of other groups, and so we no longer actually hold uh, an agronomy field day. I want to make a comment about, for the researchers, when you said field day, just make a, what, would, what did that encompass? I was thinking of somebody might want to just well, make a comment. Well, uh, our field days, <clears throat> regardless of whether they were animal mm -hmm. science or uh, uh, our, um, our uh, agronomy, uh, we tried to highlight uh, new research that was promising. And um, that, that was, I would say, would be the number one thing. And then uh, other issues, uh, what were the problems uh, last year or the year before that may be a problem in the future? And, and discuss those. That, partic that was particularly relevant to disease and insect issues I would in, in, uh, in crop production. But in terms of management, it was usually looking to what are we experimenting with, what are we studying, uh, what, ha what may have some potential in the future. Mm -hmm. Who were the, att the audience? Who was the attendees? The well, in the early years, it was primarily producers farmers and uh, they would come normally within a 75 mile radius of Purdue a few would come a greater distance they were held at the meetings were held at Purdue yes okay. at the at the agronomy center okay. and uh, in in more recent years uh, there's a high percentage were agribusiness people uh, fertilizer ag chem and seed uh, company reps uh, now, there is still a weed day held, um, which is targeted primarily to that group. The farmers are invited, but, uh, but it's primarily uh, the agribusiness uh, individuals that come to that field day. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, coordinated out of the botany and plant pathology department. All right, I see. Okay, all right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, awards that you have earned. We'll start with the most recent one. The agronomy. Oh, okay, yeah. Let's go with that one. Okay. Yeah, tell us how that came about. The you received the agronomy achievement award. This well, year. Um, the agronomic achievement award is a relatively new. I can't tell you when it was started, but I 
uh, it hasn't been in existence a long period of time, and they uh, select uh, four individuals uh, per year uh, and um, uh, present this award to them for accomplishments in the agronomic uh, area. So, uh, and mine was basically for my extension activities over the years. How did you hear, hear about it? Well, I was, uh, I received a call from, from Craig B. Rudy asking me if I planned to be in town uh, for homecoming. And I says, well, as far as I know. And he says, can I count on it? And I said, yes. <laughs> so uh, then uh, they, they publicize it in advance. Uh, it's not something that's kept secret, so... Okay, and what do you get? A plaque? What do we receive? You get a plaque? Or? Nice plaque. Yes. Okay, and mm -hmm. you can, and that's for you to keep. Yes, ah, that's mm -hmm. good. How about the Sagamore of the Wabash from the governor, Governor Orr? Well, uh, when I lived in Brazil, I'll give you a little story here. Good. When I lived in Brazil, uh, Bob Orr was a lieutenant governor, and they had a trade mission to South America. Brazil being one of those. And their airplane ran off of the end of the runway at uh, Santos Dumont Airport into the bay. And um, so the passengers from Indiana were all taken to the consulate. And uh, I personally was in Brasilia that day and flew back to Rio that night because uh, another individual uh, representing actually Purdue on that trip was to visit Visaza, uh, Purdue Project, the following day. And so it had been arranged that we had a, a car, a driver, my wife was there, and then I flew in from Brasilia. We were going to uh, go back to Visaza with uh, Ray Wilson so that he could visit our project in Visaza. So that was my first uh, opportunity to meet uh, Lieutenant Governor Orr. And then when I became, after I became uh, ANR program leader, uh, why a number of different uh, activities involved the Lieutenant Governor's office. And because of being in charge of agriculture? Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, so I, uh, I had opportunity to work with him off and on uh, during the time that I was ANR program leader and he as lieutenant governor. And I can't remember exactly how I heard about this, uh, but uh, it was a surprise, I'll tell you that. When, when and that, it's nicely framed. Yes, it is. Nicely, Signed. Nicely, yes. <laughs> Very yes. impressive. And hangs just inside my front door on the wall. <laughs> Very prominent. It should be. That's right. <laughs> How about the, um, I've seen, heard of other recent, the Frederick L. Huckey Award for Service to Rural Indiana, you received that. And I think for researchers, to make, could you make a comment? What, they think of President, they know it's named after Hubby, but rural America, how that came about. Well, this is actually, uh, I think, sponsored by the, uh, by the Indiana Farm Bureau. Okay. And so uh, that, it, the selection... And that's what, and the sponsoring organization. Yes. Okay. And, and the, uh, the um, selection, uh, anyone can nominate someone for this, but nominations come from out in the field. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's Purdue eggs primarily, but, but uh, uh, consumer family science also included in this. And uh, so they... Uh, they nominate people, and then there is a selection group or committee involving both someone out of the dean's office or whatever, as well as the, the Farm Bureau. Did the Farm Bureau, since the sponsor, did they select the name, or, or uh, they, did they? How did it come about that they decided, and then they they named it after President Humphrey? I I, I can't yeah. tell you. I don't know yeah. that background uh, right. exactly. Right, but it's nice, and, and it come, it's an annual award. Yes, yes, and I'm not certain. I, uh, at least in years past, it's been given at the Farm Bureau's uh, annual convention, mm -hmm. and uh, 
which uh, for many years was held in Indianapolis, and now they have uh, uh, decided to rotate it around the state uh, because uh, the state is a long, narrow state. So two years ago it was in Evansville. This past year it was in Fort Wayne, yeah. So which is uh, a little sidelight there. But... Uh, uh, the the award is is something that uh, uh, it's very nice. It's it's one that one uh, must appreciate because uh, you're you're nominated by someone uh, or a group or what have you that um, apparently uh, feels that you've uh, need to be recognized uh, and, and appreciated uh, adequately. Right, that's very nice. And about that, uh, the master builder of the of men, the National Farm Farmhouse. Well, that was that a real, real surprise to me. Uh, that is given annually, and it's given normally to three or four individuals. Uh, no, it's not given annually. It's given at the conclave, which is which is every other year, and three to four people are selected. And uh, again, it's uh, something where um, the nomination normally is prepared by either a chapter or an association or a combination of the two. And uh, you don't know it until after you've been selected and receive a letter. You don't know that, at least I did not know. Yeah. Were you ever on the selection committee at all for that award? Uh, yes. You've been involved. Um, you were a member of that when you were. At well, after the, after receiving it, okay. Then you're on the selection committee for two years. Well, that's nice. That makes so, it nice. Yeah. We've done yeah. that for a couple of awards committees here. The recent recipients also help in the selection yeah. of the next one or two years. Then the other one was the the ed education, the distinguished education alumni career award. Well, that one was a, a, a real surprise yeah. too. Uh, I did not know I was. Uh, I think you met, we had mentioned her. Dean uh, Marilyn Herring was the dean at that time. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, she was. She was the dean at that time. I happened to be my neighbor. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not. <laughs> she observed but, you, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. I think I think my nomination since I was uh, undergrad, agad. I think it came out of ag education, but I'm not real sure. Sure, that's nice. You, you, you never know where those come from. That's fine. So and then the uh, uh, the Ag Alumni Association when you got that distinguished one. Well, that ag. was uh, that was also a real surprise, and the reason it was such a surprise is that I actually was the chair of the selection committee. That for that year. Yes, and and I have been uh, now for probably. 15 years or more because the secretary of the board is chair of the committee and I was chair of the committee and uh, so I uh, submitted my or the committee's uh, recommendations. Uh, recommendations to the board uh, at the board meeting and, and they accepted it and uh, so then I wrote the letters to the individuals and then about two weeks later I received a letter that's very nice. Yeah. How about professional associations? Um, Soil Science and American Society of Agronomy. Well, uh, do, you, do you ever have any offices in any of them? Or? No. Okay. Mm -mm. You went to their I did national not. meetings? Uh, yes. I, uh, in, uh, of course, uh, being out of the country for a period of time, could not attend or elected not to. And uh, uh, one of my conditions for becoming and our program leader was that I could continue to participate in my professional societies and because I thought that was very important and so yeah I, I'm still a member of uh, uh, of the uh, all uh, all of them um, I do not attend the meetings any longer uh, but I do pay my uh, sure. retiree fee, uh, uh, reduced membership fee as a, as a retiree, and, uh, and and you I'm get the publications and the, you keep in touch. Um, not the journals. Oh, okay. I do not take the journals okay. uh, because I really, and if I if there's something that 
tweaks my interest, I can always go to the library. Okay. <laughs> or go online and print it out, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. But, but I no longer take the journals. I, I do get the, uh, uh, what is it, bi-monthly, quarterly uh, newsletter. You know, speaking of journals, I think that uh, many libraries, certainly even including Purdue, we have a lot of them online. And so, you know, when you're getting ready to retire, you've saved them all. And you don't know what, a lot of places just aren't taking them anymore, you know. So it's, I've, t I've shared, other people have shared that with me. You know, what am I going to do with these? I guess you'll have to recycle them. I have 40-some years of, of uh, <laughs> crop science, uh, agronomy journal, and soil science yeah. stacked in my shop. Right, I know. Uh, talk about family. Uh, make a couple comments, and then uh, your hobbies. Family. Uh, well. Where'd you meet your wife? Oh, uh, you don't want to hear that. That's a long story. Mm, is she from Indiana? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well. Did uh, you meet her in school? At I'll, school? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Okay. I, I, my mother was a, a 4-H club leader, and uh, Nancy, who is my wife, was a member of the club. Uh, but I knew her brother because we were classmates, high school classmates. And uh, so my mother said that uh, she wanted some of us to learn to square dance. And so she took four boys and four girls that said they were willing to try. And she matched us up by height. And mother wanted you to learn square dancing, right? Yes. But, uh, and so Nancy was the one that was about the right height, my height. So that's how I well, that's pretty good. Uh, started, uh, became acquainted with her. Sure. Uh, okay. because I knew who she was, but... Uh, Got to know her a little better. Yeah. Yeah. And did and your children, some, did they come to Purdue? We, we have three boys, mm -hmm. uh, all three Purdue grads. Uh, the oldest is an industrial engineer, and he works for a small company in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, the name of Hellmold, and lives at uh, Woodstock. Illinois, which is northwest of Chicago. Uh, Gregory is the middle son. Uh, he is a graduate in, in agricultural engineering and is currently employed with a small craft brewery in the state of Delaware uh, called Dogfish Head. And uh, he's their first engineer and uh, so I think it's he's enjoying that work. Mm -hmm. And the youngest one is uh, Jeffrey. He has both a, a BS and an MS in mechanical engineering from Purdue. And he is a civilian employee with the uh, Air Force, uh, stationed or out at uh, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, at Kirkland Air Force Base. Has he been with him for a while? Uh, yes, he's yeah. probably, well, uh, Ever since he yeah. received his uh, master's degree, oh, okay. he's been with the Air Force. He was out in California, uh, the big base out in the desert, uh, until they moved his unit to Kirkland, and so he moved with them to Kirkland. Uh, he, uh, he works on relatively, well, let's say, just call it classified. Mm -hmm. But uh, his crew actually assemble, develop, and assemble, and build satellites for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. That's what yeah, they do. Right. Does he like Does he like New Mexico? Oh yes, he, loves yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. More so than California, then, huh? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned in the uh, part one a little about your hobby, the woodworking. Can you make a comment about that? Some of the things you've done? Well, my woodworking, it, there are two extremes, okay? Uh, I, I say I collect sophisticated junk. And what I do, I go to auctions. And at the end of an auction, they always have this pile of old chairs or things of that nature. That nobody, that, that no one go. wants. So I buy them. I take them home and I restore them. And... Uh, you usually get them rather inexpensively. In fact, you buy a nice, well, we're not nice, but you buy a rocker for maybe $5. And then after many hours' work and effort, where well, you have a very nice rocker that has a cane seat and a cane back in it. 
So that's one extreme. Now the other is that I also do some of the old type of uh, woodworking, if you want to call it that. I split shingles from oak logs. And uh, the type of shingle would have been used uh, 150, 200 years ago on a cabin. So they're white oak shingles. I split uh, uh, normally only two, three places a year, but I split here at Battleground at the uh, show, and then I split shingles at the state fair each year. Okay. I did not split shingles last year because it did not bring a white oak log that was suitable. You can't split, uh, make shingles out of a log with knots. So the logs last year were not very high quality. Not very good. So, but uh, that's extremes of mine. And then I, I do other little things too. But then associated very sim very close to this type of thing is that the Purdue Ag Alumni Association has a very extensive collection of old farm implements. Most of these harsh wrong. And so I started probably five years ago. Uh, well, about the time I retired, uh, with the idea that I would try to restore some of these implements. Piece of equipment. <clears throat> and so I'm working, actually working on three different pieces, right? Four different pieces, right? At the current time, uh, and uh, one hopefully will be completed. Uh, just needs to be painted be completed by the time the Indiana State Fair starts this year. Uh, we do part of the work there during the fair on this particular piece. It's a horse-drawn road grader built in 1886 in Indianapolis and we rebuilt the wheels at the State Fair. And one year... Showing pe and people could see Yes, doing it. so they could see how wagon wheels and buggy wheels and what have you are are actually built or rebuilt. Uh, we have a gentleman out of uh, Michigan, and, and, and in recent years, the last four or five years, uh, another fellow out of Kentucky, and uh, they actually run a wheelwright shop during the fair. And uh, so we try to do some things. Now, last year we uh, didn't quite complete, but uh, uh, we tried to rebuild uh, the running gear uh, of a Conestoga wagon. We rebuilt the wheels probably four years ago or five years ago. Uh, but then we rebuilt the running gear, and all we need to do this year is to make what's called the evener. That's where you hook the uh, team if you pull it with a team, uh, and the tongue. And, of course, if you pull it with oxen, uh, then it's the tongue that's very important. But we, uh, once those are uh, made and uh, attached, then the running gear is ready to be painted. And it is a very bright red, and originally called vermilion red. And so hopefully we will have that painted by uh, the time the fair is over. We will do all that work during the fair on that. This coming in the this next coming year, year, 2010. Mm -hmm. Do you have a place where you exhibit these pieces? Uh, well, we have a large area at the northeast uh, corner of the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Okay. And, uh, where you keep them? Where we store them in mm -hmm. two buildings. And then also during the fair, then they're on exhibit. And uh, some of the equipment, uh, for instance, the Red River Specials, uh, separator we use to actually thrash wheat and um, so we demonstrate some of this old equipment and it's all on, e on exhibit then and then uh, another piece of equipment that we just rebuilt the wheels uh, in 07 no 08 is a horse drawn one horse drawn dump rake real old and so it, it has wooden wheels. And so those wheels were rebuilt uh, in 08. And uh, once we get the Conestoga wagon uh, uh, completed, that'll probably be the next piece I'll work on. 
and then we have um, a um, uh, road cart, a one horse, and in very bad condition. We will salvage only the metal from it, and it will be rebuilt probably during this coming year's fair. Do you do your work down there? Or? Most of the work is, uh, that type of work is, is actually done there. Now, for instance, on the road grader, I brought a lot of the pieces home because it takes it's so long to work on them, and there's no way I could do it all during the fair. And I, I last week, one day, I, I transported the blade back to the fairgrounds, and then on my return trip, I brought the two wheels back because uh, the, there are certain things that I will paint and uh, by themselves, and then then we'll have uh, have a fellow that's going to spray paint the main part of the greater than before the fair next year, so that it's 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 completed. Mm -hmm. But the wheels will take a lot of time because there's pinstriping on them and that type of thing. So uh, I'll spend. I'm not going to start those till after the first year, but. Uh, that's very, so. very nice. That's, that's a nice project. So. Yeah, people will benefit by that. Uh, I think that takes that mentions some of the things you're doing in retirement. Any, any other activities you've been involved in? No, that pretty well sums okay. it up. Right. Uh, you still, I, but you still have your office, so you still come on campus. I, I come to campus mm -hmm. uh, at least once a week, mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, have a cup of coffee and read my emails and pick up my mail and talk to folks. And see some of the students. Yeah. Um, how about uh, Purdue tradition? One come to mind? Well, there were a lot of traditions when I was an undergraduate student here that. Uh, well, share with those with us. That, that don't yeah, exist yeah. anymore. Like, well, an example would be remember for homecoming, you used to have the exhibits outside the fraternities. And the unbelievable. Residences? Absolutely unbelievable. And for nickels and dimes, because, yes. you know, the top prize would be 25, maybe 50, but not. Because mm -hmm. they used to announce the winners at the game. Yeah. Having been there, I. Well, it was such a. When, as an undergraduate student, of course, my fraternity always had a, an oh, exhibit. Oh, sure. But it was. All the streets were, were just blocked every uh, every year because people would come by drive their cars around and look at all the exhibits right, right. it was really something I talked to that's people one who tradition bring, who that, used to bring their children they lived in Lafayette and when the children were young that was the big thing they would love to come yeah that's one tradition that uh, I recall uh, the gold cords is another uh, those are those are two. Uh, now another one that I did not participate in was the painting of the water tower, okay. West Lafayette water tower. Okay. Uh, I did not participate in that at, at all. I don't know, but that was a tradition. So there were some Quite traditions like that. But right. but the one that I remember more than anything else are the exhibits, homecoming exhibits, and also. Before, Very creative, be, too. Oh, yes. And before each homecoming, or not homecoming, before each home football game, there was always a pep rally with a parade. And each housing unit had a big sign they carried on their shoulders. Uh, and uh, that's another tradition. I, 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 now, that's something that we always participated sure, in. That's right, exactly. So. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? You can have a, several or one or or whatever, like and an outstanding event. Well, where do you start? True. So, you know, there's a lot of a thing, a lot of things that have occurred. Sometimes it's hard to narrow one or two, you know, because yes. there's so many. Yes, yes. I, I don't want to pick out one. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave the closing comments, and as you look back and look ahead and think it through, I'll let you make some comments. The balls in your court. Well, uh, be, being or something I forgot to ask. Being an agronomist, I have to think about crop production. And I recall, as a nine or ten year old, um, helping shock wheat in the field, and uh, the thrash machine, steam engine, would come to the farm, and we would thrash wheat. 
and now you think of, you know, and here, here you had probably oh, 25 or 30 men with teams of horses or mules and wagons uh, to handle someone's wheat field of 15 or 20 acres. And now you take one of these large combines and 15 or 20 acres is not anywhere close to big enough for them, you know. Mm -hmm. And in terms of mechanization of agriculture, that, that it's just unbelievable what has happened. The other thing is the, the whole area of uh, genetic improvement of crops. Uh, because uh, really, when I was uh, very young, uh, still uh, uh, most of the neighbors, uh, and my dad included, you saved your own seed corn, you open pollinated, and you harvested the corn by hand. And you ha always had this little box, and it was on the back of the wagon. There was two end gates, one tall because you had the tall boards for the corn and then you had this little short end gate and a little box and the big real nice ears you threw in there because that was next year's seed corn. Um, first soybeans I recall, hay beans, not soybeans as we grow today. But they were real viney, little black seeds and we grew them for hay. And, uh, so that's why they were called hay beans, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Soybean hay. And uh, that, was, that was the introduction of soybeans into mm. the U.S., basically, was that. And then uh, uh, those are some of the things that, 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 that I can uh, think of that are just uh, unbelievable. And other things are rather subtle. Um, but uh, those things, and then recent, a fairly recent development, you think of this 75 years or so, has been the uh, move to conservation tillage and uh, or no-till, driven by a couple of things, I think. Um, soil erosion uh, or erosion control being one reason but uh, reduce input costs, fuel costs, machinery costs, are probably the number one thing that has driven uh, the uh, move to conservation tillage or no-till, mm -hmm. uh, with perhaps the uh, erosion and water quality issues, um, although we talk about those as being important from an operating farmer's standpoint, they don't want to erode their land away, but yet the number one thing they're looking at is the cost of production. And so if they can produce a crop at a similar yield level with a reduced cost, then they're all for it. What about the family farm? The what? The family farm. The family farm? Well, uh, again, uh, when I was a little, uh, no tractors, we used mules. And uh, everything is small farm, and we did all the work with, uh, with mules. And so I had to learn there how. As, there, the, there aren't as many as there were years ago of family farms, or are there? Well, and most of them. Vary. No, most of them are family farms. Right. Uh, but they're, but the size, they're much larger, and they're also incorporated uh, for several reasons. Right, good uh, point. But most, uh, most farms, at least in Indiana, uh, you can call them corporate farms if you want to, but it's a family corporation. And they're incorporated for various reasons, uh, uh, liability, uh, tax, all kinds of reasons why they would, would incorporate and again, part of which is to be able to pass that farm on to the next generation as well, so. Right. It makes it a lot easier, and then keeping it in, the, in that way, it's kept in the family. Mm -hmm. So from a little different uh, yeah. avenue. 
Yeah, when I was young, of course, all farms were relatively small. There were very few large farms in Indiana. And uh, there were some, I, I know a few that were sizable, yet those farms were very hilly, southern Indiana land, and they were primarily livestock farms mm -hmm. where, where they would have several hundred acres, but probably half to two-thirds of it would just be pasture land or grazing cattle. Most of the farms around where we lived were probably less than 180 acres. Uh, I can, just thinking back on it, uh, by the time I graduated from college, uh, the farm size had, it was increasing some. Uh, but the big changes have been recent years. Mm -hmm. More recent for me would be 25. <laughs> right. And the price, the land prices have increased yes. considerably. Yes. In fact, I noticed in in the paper this week one day where there are two parcels of land and they're talking in terms of $6,000 an acre for the land for sale. Yeah. Farmland. Yeah, so, and, and I, I own a small farm in uh, southern Indiana, and I bought my farm for $125 an acre. So uh, land prices have changed they certainly have considerably. significantly. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> I want to thank you, Dr. Christmas, very much for this interview. I really enjoyed it, and I thank you. Well, you're most welcome. My pleasure. I was going to.